Hello again guys. I want to say something else about Easy Believism. I just made a couple of videos on it and uh you know, if the gospel is so easy, so easy to people for people to believe the gospel, then why are there so few that are saved? Why isn't everyone saved? You know, and the Easy Believism person would probably be like, "Well, because they're self-righteous or something." <laughs> It's like, okay, so it's hard for them to not be self-righteous. It's hard for them to submit to the righteousness of God. I mean, the gospel is hard to believe, period, point blank. And it's almost useless to debate with these people who teach this stuff, that, that, that teach easy believism. Um, but anyways, uh, I want to go over some more end time stuff. Um, and I was just thinking about something that I think kind of helps what I've been teaching. And that is something that's controversial. And I've went back and forth on I've said different things. And it, it, I'm going to have to go through and delete a bunch of my old teachings. Uh, I'm not going to do that right away. But I do want to get rid of them and get on the right path. And um, Anyways, there's a passage that a lot of people, it, it's controversial. A lot of people disagree on and stuff. It's when Jesus said, you know, where the body is or where the carcass is, there will the, the, the vultures be gathered or the eagles be gathered. And, um, you know, and then Jesus says, you know, one will be taken, one will be left. So there's different interpretations on that. And I was teaching before, the, uh, you know, the rapture. Um, but I think that it actually goes along more with what I've been teaching now, that the Lord comes at the moment of death. Because obviously, where the body is, the eagles will be gathered, is talking about death. Okay, a dead body. So I think that that interpretation of that verse goes, it, it almost, you know, it's like a puzzle piece that fits right in with what I've been saying, that the Lord comes at death. But I want to look at this passage in Luke 17. Luke 17, 20 says, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, <laughs> when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo, here, or lo, there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And so this right here would almost seemingly refute the idea of a future physical, literal, millennial reign of Christ, okay? And these hyper-dispensational people will say, oh, but that's the kingdom of God. See, the kingdom of God is spiritual, but the kingdom of heaven is the physical, literal, millennial kingdom. And to that, I say that is a bunch of crap. And I've said over and over again that I want to go through a study and refute that, and I haven't fully done that yet. Like almost a year ago, I've been saying this, but it's still on the list, guys, whenever I get to it. But I've said that the, the kingdom of heaven is only mentioned in Matthew, as far as I know. And uh, it's a figure of speech where God and heaven are used interchangeably in, in a bunch of different verses in the Bible. Okay, You know, we use that, that kind of figure of speech today all the time, where we interchange things like that that are, that are related. God and heaven are related. Heaven's where God is. You know... There might be verses in the Bible that's like, oh, hear me, heaven, okay? Heaven's a place. Is heaven, you know, is he speaking to heaven? No, he's speaking to God, okay? Basically, we can see it like that. But but here he says, you know, you won't, the, king, the kingdom of God comes without observation. You won't see it uh, coming. You won't know. And it's within you. And there's a lot of controversy about what it means it's within you. Uh, you know, I think generally people probably would take it as like spiritual, you know, it's within you. Um, but then people object to that and they say, well, the Pharisees weren't saved. So why would he say the kingdom of God is within you? But yeah, maybe he's just generally speaking. Okay. And I kind of feel like that's what he's saying now. Some other people say, you know, it's, you know, it's around you like Jesus and his disciples was there. So that was, you know, the kingdom of God and, and he was in their presence or whatever, but I think that he is saying that it's spiritual, that you're not going to see it come. It's It comes not with observation, but let's continue. Luke 17, 22, And he said unto the disciples, These days will come, and you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you shall not see it. And they shall say to you, See here, or see there, or go, go not after them, nor follow them. For as the lightning 
that light, lighteneth out of the one part under heaven, shineth unto the other part of heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. And I think that that means quick, without warning, uh, just like when he says it comes as a thief in the night, it comes as lightning, lightning fast, right? Okay, quick, without warning. And then Luke 17.25, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected of his generation, okay, before he comes back, of this, rejected of this generation. Luke 17.26, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Okay, likewise in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone and heaven from heaven and destroyed them all. Okay. Uh, for even thus shall be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So I saw somebody leave comment on my video about the rapture or whatever today, and they're talking about how they're like post-trib. And I've refuted, I've talked about mid-trib and post-trib, how they, they don't they don't work out. There's lots of problems. But one of the problems is they believe in the millennial reign, uh, millennial kingdom, and they say that the rapture comes before the millennial kingdom, so all of the saints have glorified bodies, and then they, they look at these passages where it says like the days of Noah, the days of Lot, and, and the flood came, and destroyed them all, a fire came, and destroyed them all, and they say that uh, that's the, the Lord Jesus at his second coming, uh, to rule and reign in the millennial kingdom. So therefore the saints have glorified bodies and all the wicked are destroyed. So there's nobody who's physically alive to, and to, you know, go into the kingdom and to breed, et cetera, et cetera. And then we know that there's going to be like a war with like the, 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 you know, their interpretation. There's a war of like Gog and Mag Magog, I think, uh, when Satan is loose, like towards the end of a thousand years, and I'm saying, you know, I don't really think that I believe in any of this anymore. But I'm just saying that's how they teach it. So there's a contradiction there. They they say that if they're post-trib, then all the believers have glorified bodies, and uh, all the wicked people are destroyed. So there's nobody that is, you know, human left to inherit the kingdom. And that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And they try to find ways around it. They say that children can go into it. Children might not be raptured, but they'll, they'll go into the kingdom or whatever. It's all a bunch of nonsense. They cannot work that out. And then also, they there are passages like this where it says that they're not expecting this destruction. Okay? They're eating, drinking, giving in marriage. They're living it up. Okay? But if we go with this premillennial interpretation of Revelation and Daniel's 70th week, we see that the last three and a half years after the abomination of desolation, there's the mark of the beast is implemented, and God's heaven angels pour out vials of his wrath on these people, and they're being stung to the point where they're like begging to die, and they can't die, and all these horrible things are happening to them. But here he says it's like in the days of Lot when they're living it up, and they're having fun, and it's unexpected. Okay, that does not sound like eating and drinking and giving in marriage. It sounds like a horrific nightmare where they want to die, and they can't. Okay, so they cannot put these things together. And I think that what I've recently come to understand, that the second coming is the Lord coming at death. Uh, it, it almost fits like a glove, okay? But it's left to be understood how to interpret Revelation, you know, what it's all symbolic of and everything. There's something else, but... Um, <laughs> So, see, it makes perfect sense if it comes at death. They're eating, they're drinking, they're not expecting anything. Bam! Now they have to face judgment. Now they're going to hell. And they're going to wish that they would have repented while they were alive. Okay? And so, in Luke 17, 30, it says, Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed, which could be the second coming after death, when, when he's seen, when he appears, when he's manifested to the individual. Uh, now this one seems a little bit confusing, but maybe uh, it's Luke 17:31. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not turn back. Okay. 
I have to figure out kind of how to understand this, but I think that in that day, if we kind of just overlook that, uh, basically the idea here is, you know, you must continue to follow Christ. Um, you know, that's what he said, like, he who doesn't put his hand to the plow or whatever, you know, and, and keep it is not worthy to be my disciple. That's basically the same language here. Okay, don't look back. You have to, you know, make the choice to follow me. Okay, so this seems to be talking about, like, before the Lord comes. He's kind of, like, going back, tracking or something. And remember Lot's wife. Um, so, it's kind of confusing here, because he says, Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. And then he says, In that day he which shall be upon the housetop. Um, so, I don't know, but let's continue. But I think the general idea here is talking about salvation. Uh, it's not talking about leaving uh, after the abomination of desolation, you know, fleeing Jerusalem or whatever. And, and that talk, talk, talks about that in Matthew 24, and that's something else, you know. I'll have to go over that separately. But I'm just looking here at Luke. And I'm saying that what he's saying here is basically the same thing that he said that he that he who you know puts his hand to the plow and and looks back or whatever is not worthy to be my disciple. That's the same thing that he's saying here. It's like a salvation message in a way. So, and remember Lot's wife: whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it again. That's like the salvation thing. He said stuff like this over and over. I'll tell you: in that night there shall be two men. In one bed. Okay, this is the night when the Lord comes, or when He's revealed, or when He appears. Okay, one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together, one shall be taken, the other left. Two men shall be in the field, the other one shall be taken, the other one left. Okay, so suddenly, uh, randomly, um, you know, He's going to come for individuals. And they answered and said to him, Where your Lord? And he saith unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. They will be dead. Okay. And so, it seems to be speaking of death here. Uh, you know, and that's the second coming, I think. That's really, truly when the righteous inherit the kingdom. You know, that's the sheep goat, goat judgment, okay? You know, if a sheep, uh, you know, an unbeliever dies, he's going to be judged by the Lord. And, you know, the Lord will say, uh, you know, I was naked and you didn't clothe me and whatever. He says that to that individual. That individual goes to eternal eternal torment in hell. Okay. Um, so that's, I mean, it seems to fit like a glove, really. Matthew 24 is kind of the same thing, but there's more to it. It talks about the abomination of desolation and stuff, and there's more stuff that needs to be understood. But I think that Luke is very helpful there. And we see the same thing here. He says, you know, he talks about the flood came, took them, and, you know, that's what this, the coming of the Son of Man is like. So he's basically saying... You know, death happens at any time. These unbelievers are going to be completely unaware. Um, you know, it's going to come unaware for believers too, but believers are prepared and, you know, looking towards that. Um, but he's saying, you know, for the unbelievers, it's going to be destruction. It's going to be eternal torment and hell. And he says again, you know, the two, two shall be in the field, one shall be taken, and the other left, two women shall be grinding at the mill, uh, one taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Okay, so we could be one of these people. We could be the guy in the field. Could be the woman grinding at the mill. Okay, make sure that you are saved today. Okay, and don't look back. Pick up your cross, you know, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow him. Okay. 
That's what Jesus is saying. He says, If the good man of the house would have known, and that watch when the thief would have come, he would have watched, he would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, suddenly, just like lightning, just like a thief, the Son of Man comes. And so I want to look a little bit further back. Um, you know, the abomination of desolation stuff, I still got to figure that out. So I just kind of skip over that for now. But uh, let's see. It says, if any man shall say to you, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, Matthew 24, 23, and then, for there shall arise false Christ, false prophets, shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they say to you, behold, he is in the desert, go not forth, behold, he is in secret chambers, believe it not, for as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So this is quick, without warning suddenly um, and spiritually, I would say, um, Matthew twenty four twenty nine. immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall be fallen from heaven. The powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now this is one that, you know, would throw everybody off. And it's very interesting. And I'll come back to this, actually. I want to go to Second Peter 3.10, because I mentioned that in a video. Second Peter 3.10 talks about the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. And I said basically that my understanding of this right now is that the day of the Lord again is the Lord coming at death, and all this uh, stuff about the heavens passing away with a great noise, elements being melted, and the earth and the works being burned up. I think it's figurative language, and what it's saying is in that moment at death, you know, the old way of life, the old world for that individual who has just died is gone. Okay, I'm thinking this is saying in the life of that individual, the heavens shall pass away. Uh, all this stuff is gone. The former things are gone now. And so I think that could be the same language here in Matthew 24. If we understand it like figuratively, people want to think it literally. They want to think that, you know, stars are literally going to fall out of the sky and stuff like that. And I believe that before too, but I think that we need to understand it figuratively. So we can see kind of the comparison with that in Second Peter verse three, Second uh, Peter chapter three verse ten. Okay, so. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. So he, he could say, you know, after after your persecution or after, you know, after your life, basically. Then the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers and the heavens shall be shaken, the old world is passed away. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Okay. Um, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Again, and I've mentioned this before with the, uh, the sheep, the goat judgment, and, and lots of other verses and stuff. This doesn't have to be an all-encompassing one-time event where all the tribes of the earth are present and mourning at the exact same time. Okay. This could be a general idea that over time, everybody is going to be judged by the Lord. Okay? So at the moment of death, the old world's going to pass away. Everybody's going to see that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the Son of God. He is sitting on the throne. He is going to judge every man. And, um, and basically, so all the, all the unbelievers will mourn. And uh, the angels will gather his elect. And this could be angels gathering believers. And I've said before that it's angels gathering uh, Israel to, or gathering the Jews to Israel. But, you know, I think that I could be wrong. And this could be them gathering the saints to heaven. But, I mean, what I've always heard before is people saying this is the rapture. 
that he's gathering his believers to be raptured. But no, I'm saying that he's gathering them after death um, to be with him in heaven because they have eternal life. You know, that's the resurrection is what I'm saying. I'm saying that this is speaking of the resurrection, which happens after death. But I think that fits pretty good. Okay, but then we get into the now that learn the parable of the fig tree when the branch is tender, you know. Okay, I don't know how to interpret this part. But I basically wanted to make this video just to mention when Jesus says that uh, wherever the body is is where the eagles will be gathered. I mean, it's basically, we should we can understand that as death. And that fits in perfectly with what I've been teaching. And one taken and one left fits in perfectly with what I've been teaching. And he's saying, be ready, I could come at any time. Okay, so I know there's people that are going to buck this and want to believe in the rapture, mid-trib, post-trib, pre-trib, whatever it may be. But uh, I think what we have here is a, a bunch of messages speaking of the resurrection, speaking of you know eternal life, being with the Lord in heaven, at death. Um, it could come at any time. And that, that verse in Luke, I said, you know, that Jesus said the kingdom of God is within. He said it won't come with observation. And that almost directly refutes the, the physical, literal kingdom, millennial kingdom. And uh, so, and you, and you, might understand, you might ask, well, then what about the end times? What about things that Revelation says and stuff? Well, that's the big question. That has to be found out. But I think that uh, I don't even see really a way around that. Where he says it's not going to come with observation. Okay. So. Thanks for watching. God bless.